Okay, so welcome. We will start um, with our next, um, actually, program um, point that we have. It's not a panel. It's a round table discussion. And I warm, warmly welcome Joseph Moser and Livia Erdeschi. Um, um, our round table discussion will be about Johnny Moser and his private archive, a pioneer of early Holocaust research in Austria. Um, we have with us uh, Joseph Moser, who is Associate Professor of German at Westchester University of Pennsylvania. And he also serves as, as the book re review editor for the Journal of Austrian Studies. As a Germanist, he has published on Thomas Bernhard, Lilian Faschinger, Franz Kafka, Robert Schindel, Andreas Pittler, Ruth Beckermann, Czernowitz writers, the Austrian contemporary novel, and also uh, the Bockerer film series. And in Holocaust studies, he has published his father's, um, Johnny Moser's biography. Um, now I also want to present my colleague, Livia Erdeschi. Um, she will um, moderate this roundtable discussion with me. Um, Livia Erdeschi is the project manager in the archives department at the Arelson Archives and represents the Arelson Archives at the European Holocaust Research Infrastructure, ERI, which we heard about before, where she also leads uh, the work package on microarchive. Um, she holds degrees in cultural, cultural and social anthropology with a minor in Jewish studies from the University of Vienna and in public policy from Tel Aviv University. Um, she is cur currently pursuing a degree in cu curating, educating, and managing at the University of Applied Arts Vienna. Her research re revolves around historical and political education, as well as social political practices in museums. And so the round table is open, and we start with a short presentation by Joseph Moser. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne, for this lovely introduction and for having me here today. So for those of you who uh, may not know uh, a lot about Johnny Moser, I'm going to start with a little bit of an overview of his work as a historian and his biography as well. Um, what you have here is basically a presentation by the second generation. Uh, I'm, I'm 50 years younger than my father was, so I should look like a third generation person, but I'm still second generation. Um, Johnny Moser lived from 1925 to 2011, uh, made it to you know, a fairly advanced age at 85 and a half, and became um, recognized in, oh, wow, I need to do this. How do I move the slide? As some of you may be aware of this, but I believe the first book on the Holocaust in Austria is Johnny Moses' The Judenverfolgung in Österreich 1938 bis 1945, a really, really small book, a very, uh, a book that you could almost overlook, but actually almost every American university library had a copy of this book. And for the next two decades, up to the mid 80s, it was the book to go to when you were interested in the Holocaust, because he really was the first person to be interested in this topic. At a time when the general public was hostile in Austria to studying the Holocaust, and there wasn't a whole lot of support. Um, uh, the interest in the Holocaust in Austria was primarily abroad, um, so Johnny Moser was uh, in contact with a lot of researchers outside of, of Austria as well. But let me show you a few other Books. Uh, this may be less um, uh, something that you're less aware of, which is the 1978 Der Gelbe Stern in Österreich, which was also part of a uh, exhibition in Eisenstadt. And um, Johnny Moser was born in Burgenland, so he's a Burgenland Jew, and so um, so he's also been recognized there for his research into the history of, um, of Jewry in Burgenland and the Holocaust in Burgenland. Uh, another book that he's very well known for, it's also a small book actually, but it's the Demographie der Jüdischen Bevölkerung Österreichs, 1938 to 1945, so demography of, uh, of the Jewish population of Austria, and that's based on a lot of the documents that he collected in the 1950s and 60s. And so he, this is still, I can tell, pretty much the, 
the main source if you're interested in, in the demog demography of, of Jews before the Holocaust. Um, a radically different topic is his uh, uh, biography, because um, this focuses not just on being driven out of Burgenland, then moved to Vienna, but actually with his exile in Hungary, surviving the Holocaust in Hungary, where he had the great fortune of meeting Raoul Wallenberg very early on. So then he is actually, was one of the main eyewitnesses of Raoul Wallenberg's work in Budapest, uh, which is quite remarkable when you consider there are over 100,000 Jews in, in Budapest who needed to be saved, and through a coincidence, he got to meet him relatively early and worked as an errand boy, as the German title, Wallenbergs Laufbursche, Jugenderinnerungen, so Youth Memories, 1938 to 1945. Biography stops abruptly in 1945, so it doesn't actually deal um, with his work after the war. He didn't think that was interesting. It's actually very interesting, too. Uh, and finally, this was published, uh, his last book was published after his passing in 2011. Um, the ersten, uh, Nisko, the ersten Judendeportationen, so Nisko, the first deportations of Jews. So uh, Eichmann experimented with deporting Jews to Poland. There was nothing there yet, just um, a, a random place, Nisko. Um, this is something that is very often overlooked in Holocaust studies, and Johnny Moser had documents, deportation lists, and those are still in his archive. So let me tell you a little bit about um, how he started working as a historian, uh, which, uh, you know, bef long before he was a historian, he had notebooks. And the oldest notebook is the one on the right here from 1944. Um, the reason why that's the oldest one is that he and his parents and his sister Herma were almost um, deported to Auschwitz, uh, which meant by the time they got to the deportation site in Bekash Media, outside of Budapest, they had nothing left. Everything had been taken from them. Um, and uh, he uh, survived by going up to Novak, who was the, one of Eichmann's henchmen, and he just simply said, we're not Jews, this is an error. And, and Novak said, well, I like, your, I like your Austrian accent go over there. Now, it's more complicated, right? It's also, it was July 8th, 1944, July 8th or 7th, I should look this up. Horty had just decreed an exception for some Hungarian Jews, and so that's part of the group they were allowed to join. So that's, they escaped the last train from Bekash Media that was going to Auschwitz. And, but so then this notebook is acquired um, in the fall of 1944. So there's really nothing collected from Budapest from early on. And then the other notebook is from 1945. Now, what's quite fascinating uh, in this notebook is that on March 8, 1945, in this notebook, he writes in very legible German handwriting a little essay on the Buden Budapester Judenverfolgung, so the Holocaust, the Budapest Holocaust. Uh, Judenverfolgung was the term at that point. Um, War hasn't even ended yet. And what he's concerned about, as you can see already there, he talks about uh, October 15th, it's in the third line. Uh, um, that was when Horty gave his radio address and that the Germans disposed of Regent Horty. And in this radio address, which you can find on YouTube in Hungarian, uh, Horty actually indicts the Nazis. Uh, um, for killing Jews, so there's quite an awareness of this in Budapest, and so then he, but then what he writes about is, of course, the arrow cross in Budapest, uh, um, killing Jews, rounding them up. Um, yeah, but so here you have a 19-year-old writing such an essay, and I'll talk a little bit more why he probably wrote this essay, um, because he wasn't planning to be a historian yet. Uh, Chronology, there's a chronology throughout the notebook, but every single day what happens, bombings, where they moved, where they lived. Surviving in Hungary basically involved four years of homelessness, right? You're constantly moving from one place to the next, depending on charity, trying to avoid the Hungarian authorities, trying to avoid being sent to a labor camp, uh, and then in the final year, of course, trying to avoid the arrow cross. Um, it's a very... Uh, his, his, uh, you even see corrections in his notebooks. He was, was quite, you know, trying to be as accurate as possible. And then this is the notebook that he ultimately used to write his biography, which was published in 2006. So 1944 to 2006, that's, you know, 
uh, my math, 62 years or something like that. So uh, unlike other survivors, he was really concerned about having sources. And, and the notebook helped him with that. Um, in addition to a chronology and, and little essays, um, he had specific maps. And you see here, um, Bekaj Media, this is the deportation site, which I believe doesn't have a single marking in Budapest today. There's another deportation site, Kishtarcha, which does have a memorial. Uh, Be Bekesh Media, if, if you know of a memorial, I'd be happy to hear that. Uh, my sense is it's full of these panel, these, um, uh, in Hungarian they call it panel, uh, panel, uh, Plattenbauten, these Soviet era apartment buildings, so probably was all destroyed. But what it was then is a Ziegel fabric, a brick factory, and you can see the railway, another street, and then the railway line, which fit into, uh, that led into the Have. The Have is the local barn in, in Budapest, and, and similar to other cities where there were deportations, it was an unimportant railway line. And then you have another place where they were held on Chapel before they went to Bekes Media. So he's trying to, he's, he's documenting things, right? but documenting things for himself, primarily, so he'll remember them. Um, and then you can visit some of these sites. Then, then uh, after uh, they avoided deportation, they were taken to the Tolons Haas, and Tolons Haas is not an, an expression in Hungarian anymore. It would be Abschiebe House, something like that. It doesn't exist in, in today's Hungary. Um, today it's the Police Museum of Hungary, and you can go visit it. But then he again has, uh, you know, some rudimentary uh, um, notes on that, also on the, the uh, camp in Eastern Hungary in Vice, where he was, and it says here March 20th, 42, to December 10th, 1942. And I'm not sure that there's any, you know, I don't think there's anything in Vice right now either. Then the Zsidó Kohas, uh, the Jewish hospital in the Sabolcs Utsa, um, also that, when he was there and what the rooms looked like. So, he was incredibly lucky in Budapest that um, in early August they went to the, the villa that was owned by the Zwack family. Zwack family, you might know, they make the famous herbal liquor Unicum. And they went there, uh, uh, well, for alms. They were begging, essentially, right? Uh, and, and one of the uh, members of the Zwack family uh, brought them in and was surprised that they had actually survived deportations to Auschwitz. And, and said, well, stay here. We have somebody here from Sweden who can help you. And they met Raoul Wallenberg relatively early. Um, Raoul Wallenberg was staying at Minerva Utsa 1A because right next door was the Swedish embassy. And the Zwack family, of course, wanted Wallenberg to stay in their house for protection. So, um, And then here, this is the former Swedish embassy, which has a memorial to Wallenberg. You may have seen it if you're interested in the topic. You can visit that in Budapest. Um, so we still have both Schutzpässe that were issued by Wallenberg. This one is for uh, my aunt, and it has a very clean copy. You can see it's uh, 148, so it was a really low number. It was one of the first passports. Uh, what's different from the other Schutzpässe is that it actually has uh, the exit visa for Hungary. You see the Kiutasash. Kiutasashra Pulasoti, and then Durchreisesichtvermerk transit visa for um, Germany, so they could have gone to Sweden. They ultimately didn't go to Sweden because traveling through Germany during the bombings at the end of the war wasn't uh, a totally safe idea. Um, so when you folded it up, you, on the back you had the swastikas, and I'll show you my father's um, Schutzpass looks almost exactly the same. Um, when he did errands for Wallenberg, the Arrow Cross were not really impressed by the Schutzpass, but they were impressed by the swastikas, of course, so, so that gave him some um, protection. Also in his notebook, um, you can see a map of the cellars um, in a large building complex that starts out on Calvin Tear, and today there's an Erste Bank building that was built, I think, in the last 20 years. Um, up until 2000, it was just an empty lot because there was that much fighting in World War II. All of these buildings, there's a lot of buildings in these blocks, you, know, you can see that, um, they were connected. The basements, the cellars were connected so you could escape if one building collapsed. And, um, and that's where they experienced the Soviet liberation on January 15th, 1945. After days, 
of having arrow cross throwing grenades into the basements. It was a very intense time. Um, yeah, and then of course his um, autobiography, going back to that, simply ends with 1945. And um, there's a whole lot more uh, to, to, to Johnny Moser, and that's something we will be talking about very briefly uh, in, in just a few moments. Um, I wanted to show you a picture that I think um, represents him more, uh, uh, represents his work after the war. Here you see him at the uh, cemetery in Eisenstadt, right? And he was very active um, with the history of Jews in Burgenland, and particularly also founding the Jewish Museum in Eisenstadt. And uh, it was very impressive. Uh, three years ago, he was uh, featured in, in, uh, in both the Landesmuseum and in the Jewish Museum. Uh, um, they still remember him, so that's, that was quite special. Um, and here you see him engaged with people who want to know more about this history at a time still in the late 70s um, when the interest wasn't, um, wasn't all that uh, um, big in Austria. And in fact, I mean, many of you know, it's around 1986, Waldheim years, where, where everything changes and shifts in this country about 35 years ago, where people start asking questions what actually happened. And beforehand, uh, you know, you think about somebody like Thomas Bernhardt, who was a nest and he, I mean, he did, I mean, it's harmless what he wrote, but it, it really did upset people to hear about this topic. So to a large extent, he ended up working in isolation and not in, in, in the atmosphere that we have in Austria today, which is, is, is much, more, much more open uh, to studying the Holocaust, although that's also a difficult topic, right? Um, and finally, uh, in 2018, actually, the city of Vienna, totally by surprise to me, uh, invited us to come to the inauguration of a park that was dedicated on Schottenring U-Bahn station, which is just around where he uh, um, lived, so quite a nice place. Uh, I should also mention, um, yes, on the one hand, he's a historian, he's a Zeitzeuge, he's a witness. You can't live off that. He was a trafficant, right? He sold tobacco. Uh, uh, you don't make a lot of money with that, but it's a stable income. Um, he was Bezirksrat in the first district here for 32 years, very active in the Social Democratic Party. And then he did research as a historian, uh, became a father late in life in the mid-1970s. So how did he have the time to do all of this? I don't know. Uh, I do remember him getting up early on Sunday mornings and, and typing. So I think that's when a lot of stuff happened. Um, he did not have institutional support uh, like other historians. So, so to a large extent, a lot of what he did and how he collected it was all self-guided. Um, he had to leave school when the Anschluss came, so that was in uh, 1938 when he was 12 and a half years old. Uh, he did the Not Matura, which was available after, after um, uh, uh, and then studied chemistry. Then his parents died, so that led some things. And he'd, instead of doing chemistry, then he got his Dr. Phil uh, in, in history at the University of Vienna with a dissertation on anti-Semitism in Austria, which he completed in 1961. Um, so he did have the trained background as a historian, but he was essentially an independent scholar. Uh, yeah, he was a founding member of the Dokumentationsarchiv des Österreichischen Widerstandes, um, and that's how a lot of contacts were made too with international scholars, and that's something we can talk about as we segue. So thank you for your attention, and we can... Thank you very much for these very interesting insights in your father's work and research activities. Um, you mentioned several times um, the notebooks that your father used, um, and I'd be very interested in um, hearing more about what role those notebooks played for, the re like for your father's research, but maybe also as a Holocaust survivor, so what role those notebooks mm -hmm. had. Yeah, so Thank thanks you. for that question. Um, so what's, uh, I didn't realize this as a child growing up in Vienna as the son of a Holocaust survivor. There weren't all that many. I thought all Holocaust survivors spent day and night 
thinking about it and telling you about it mm -hmm. and researching it because, I mean, that's how you deal with trauma, isn't that how that works? Pardon my humor. Mm -hmm. Then I, in the United States, in the United States I got to meet many more survivors in the 1990s. There were still many that you could speak with. And I suddenly realized most people, if they're going to talk about this, they only started talking recently. They needed decades to process. And then I met people who said, yeah, my parents never told me anything about it, and they refused to talk about it. So the coping mechanism usually is, 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 is I'm not a psychologist, but I think suppression is more common. The notebook was, I think, less important for his research than it was for his own Aufarbeitung, processing um, on this past. Um, and uh, it's something I was only allowed to touch a few times <laughs> during his lifetime. Um, and, 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 uh, but he went to it a lot to remember um, um, things about what happened in Budapest. Now, as far as his research is concerned, um, he was interested, I mean, uh, he was not an expert on Hungarian history. That came later when he wrote his biography. He was interested in the Holocaust in Austria. So, uh, and that was only partially in the notebook. There were some notes about what happened in Pandorf, and then he would go back to that. But he did research that involved, you know, collecting primary documents at a time when nobody wanted these documents. Um, so he asked questions also that nobody wanted to ask, which is how were these how were these deportations organized? When did they happen? How many people left on what day? How were they selected? All these basic questions. Difficult to process because you immediately, we all know that now, the Jewish communities were assigned by the Nazis to do this. In Vienna, of course, too. Right? Um, so, and an important note, I should say, his brother-in-law was Wilhelm Krell, who was Amtsdirektor der IKG. So he ended up having a lot of contact with the EKG, which at that point, much older generation of not men primarily, who were not interested in, 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 in this history, started throwing documents away, sometimes literally just giving them to him. Um, and because he was the odd, he was this odd young person, 40 years old, younger than that, in, in the mid-1960s, um, who, who collected these documents. So what was he interested? He was interested in deportations, he was interested in Theresienstadt. Um, and, and, and in his collection, I've, I've seen correspondence, which we'll get to in a moment, too, where he, uh, he's trying to find things out about Theresienstadt in the mid-60s. And I'm thinking to myself, why is he asking these questions? Because we all, oh, because how would you know until you're the first one to ask, right? Um, so, the notebook is primarily was there to remember, um, to remember what um, what he experienced in Budapest, um, but it shows a, a kind of a, an analytical way of thinking, like a historian who wants to take notes, organize his thoughts, um, um, and I think that's I think that answers your question, and because I know the follow up question, which, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, you just mentioned also shortly that, like, so the notebook was a way also to deal with trauma or to cope with his past. Um, so in general, it's interesting to hear maybe that um, uh, if documenting the past for him was, like, as a historian, was it a way to distance also maybe himself a bit from this personal narrative? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, and, like, how... Yeah, how he dealt with that. He definitely, he definitely tried to distance himself. Um, now, when we talk about trauma, I have to tell you that in 1980s, early 1980s Austria, nobody would have used that word. Nobody would have played with those psychological terms. That just wasn't done. Uh, at least not, not, he wouldn't have seen it that way. Um, there were uh, a few habits he had where he said, yeah, I'm a little crazy. Like, you can't, he couldn't throw bread away. He couldn't lock the apartment door, and he said, okay, that's because of the time. Uh, what I can tell you is that I knew about the Holocaust when I was four or five years old already. Every Sunday walk, suddenly, at some point, this, the story would come, oh, this is how I escaped the last train to Auschwitz, and the same narrative would come. And at that point, he would get really agitated. I mean, you know, like when you're telling something that really gets you upset, 
And then he'd tell the story, and then it was over. And then 20 years later, around 2000, he would still tell the story, but he wasn't quite as agitated. I'm thinking back now about, okay, 1980, it was only 35 years. I mean, if I think about 35 years ago, that's not that far away. Um, so with time, these things mellowed. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he couldn't keep it away from me. So then some people say, did that traumatize me? No. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I was shocked when I once said, oh, but you just have all these cool war stories, right? These adventure stories. And it's not an adventure, right? You know? But at the same time, he, there, there wasn't really a distance. It was, it was constantly going on. Um, so it was definitely, uh, uh, being a historian, working with this very rationally, um, and there was never really any emotion uh, in terms of, of crying, except for Shoah. It was the one time I saw him cry when he watched Shoah in 1985 when it came out. Um, and I wasn't allowed to see that. So for some reason, that was one, of, it was only 10 years old. But I was allowed to hear the stories at home. Um, but so, and I really thought everybody, every, every, every child of a Holocaust survivor heard these stories. But, um, um, and there was, there was no real filter. Uh, at the same time, uh, I don't think it was traumatizing in that regard um, for me. But some people would probably say children shouldn't hear about it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a controversial story. That's just who he was. Uh, and, and so to, to, to pinpoint uh, an answer to your question, yes. By being a historian, it was a Wissenschaft, right? You have this distance. He could have been explaining to me chemical molecules or something. I mean, it was depersonalized at, at times, too. Um, yeah. Yeah, so thank you. And um, a question that um, I would have, you have described your father as an independent scholar, um, also working on topics that in Austria no one wanted to hear about, as someone who was like also lonely, a lonely fighter, right? And But at the same time, he communicated with other survivors and also other pioneers of Holocaust documentation. So do you have any traces of these networks in his archives, in his personal writings, and maybe you even have personal memories uh, of these people? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so in his, um, in his archive I found um, correspondence with Hagi Adler, so, or H.G. Adler in English, so, and, and what surprised me about that, he got really excited about meeting him. And, and uh, this is at a time when it was not cheap to fly to London from Vienna for somebody who ran a traffic. Uh, and, but no, he met him in Munich, and then he even flew to London to find out more about Theresienstadt, because many of you, of course, know that, that Hage Adler wrote uh, the famous book on Theresienstadt. So that um, was definitely a, a, a big thing he talked about. He, he knew Claude Lanzmann. Uh, though, of course, obviously, Lanzmann did not interview him. Um, they did appreciate each other, and there was contact, uh, also correspondence. But um, going to Claude Lanzmann, so Johnny Moser asked questions that most people weren't ready to ask in the 60s and 70s. So he had correspondence with Benjamin Murmelstein, who you might know was, yeah, I see a lot of people nodding. And Lanzmann also, of course, interviewed Murmelstein very early, understanding that this is somebody who has information. But then, of course, it doesn't end up in show and it doesn't get published. And I think it's 2013 uh, as the last, uh, Le Dernier des Injustes, the last of the, uh, the Letzte der Ungerechten, I forget the English title. And um, people that I actually got to meet in, in our apartment, many, many uh, of the people who wanted to talk to him came to the apartment. Uh, Raul Hilberg, I remember, uh, because uh, there were so many guests, I always expected the guests to interact with me for at least a minute or two, at least admire my toys. And Raul Hilberg came in and he was very, very earnest, very matter of fact, didn't want to see the children. So I didn't let go. And then my father expected people to be kinderfreundly. He had to like children. So if you didn't like children, you Too got punished. Sorry. Too bad in Vienna. <laughs> so, well, yes, I know. But he was, he was all that was uh, uh, almost a political thing. You had to like children. And, and so I got up on the couch, and I started poking Raul Hilberg, and eventually yeah. took his glasses. And I forgot about that for many years. And then I watched... Showa, and you all remember 
the glasses that Hilbeck was in showing, I pulled those off. So, yeah, but uh, that's the only, and only one I remember being naughty with. Most people, uh, uh, and there were, uh, I mean, all the ladies who came always talked, and, and most of the men too, but the Hilbeck didn't. Um, the phone was constantly ringing. Um, there were constantly inquiries. Uh, to the point that he, every time the phone would ring, he'd have this exasperated, you know, oh my God, what's now? And then, of course, he, he loved it, that's, that's for sure. But um, other names, well, of course, Henry Friedlander and Sybil Milton, um, very frequent guests, um, uh, Evan Bukey. Um, and most recently, uh, I, I realized uh, Betsy Anthony, who just wrote a, a very interesting book, um, and um, unfortunately, I didn't note the title, but you can look it up. She actually interviewed him in February 2011, which was about five months before he passed away. So she must have been one of the, the, the most recent scholars uh, upon whom he left an impression. It's, um, it's the one about the return to Vienna? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. I think yes. it's Return to Vienna. Yeah. Yeah. It's the Return to Vienna, yeah. Um, and I'm just checking that that's, um, yeah, that's, that's, now there's many more, and I probably left some people out. Uh, uh, there is, in the, in the you know, in, in his archive, and, you know, when we talk about an archive, you have to imagine a wall as wide as this, stacked with, you know, uh, from bottom to, to the ceiling. But it wasn't all Holocaust stuff, right? So when he passed away in 2011, I started working through it. And it was uh, like reading 20 different narratives at the same time, because suddenly there'd be you know, a Gestapo file, or there'd be a deportation list, and then a Billa ad from 1998, then a letter from somebody asking for some information, then, then something, then, then a bill that was still there that had been paid to me. Anyway. So um, this was not somebody who was a professional archivist or who, uh, but you weren't allowed to touch it during his lifetime because he, he knew how to find things, right? And he probably did remember where things were somehow. And, 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 um, but things were very much uh, mixed up. So as I was working through it between 2011 and 2018, um, I, I did come across a lot of letters, and I wasn't preparing for this uh, question. So what stands out in my mind, of course, is, is the correspondence with Murmelstein. Uh, and, and Hage Adler. And of course, when we talk about Murmelstein, then Dorn Rabinovich in the 90s wrote uh, a book when the time was right for it to talk about the EKG uh, during the time of the Holocaust. And I remember the two of them talking. Um, but the Murmelstein letters are interesting because Murmelstein, of course, and then you see this in the Lanzmann film, which came out after my father passed away. Um, I mean, Murmelstein was a both willing to correspond and at the same time hesitant. And, and he, there's one letter, and it's just the carbon copy of that he sent to Rome. It's like trying to calm Murmelstein down. Look, I'm not trying to accuse you. I just want to know how this worked. I really just want to figure out what was going on. Um, and and, and, and uh, I asked him about Murmelstein, and, and he said, uh, my, my father, and he said, well, if it hadn't been Murmelstein, it would have been somebody else. So it's not the Murmelstein, the person that he was interested in. He was interested in um, uh, how these, these deportations worked, what was going on in Vienna. Why was he interested in it? It was, of course, an autobiographical fear, right? Because if they hadn't been sent to Budapest by the Gestapo, uh, they would have ended up in Theresienstadt, very likely, because that's where, where the Jews of Vienna went to in 1942. So, so he's trying to research things he didn't live through, but that would have very likely have happened if this strange deportation to Hungary hadn't occurred beforehand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, that's everything that you tell, like how he communicated, how he worked, how he interacted with other people, um, I think it, this is central if you have like this archive that is not an institutionalized archive, but it's a private archive at, at the moment at least. And if you know how someone worked and you, you, you are someone who really knew him very well, then you also have 
some other kind of access to this archive than someone who just looks at these papers and tries to impose an institutional logic or his own logic. So I think that is really crucial also for future archival endeavors to, to know how your father really worked. So yeah, I will, the next question is for yeah. you. Yeah. So. Um, as you just mentioned before also that your father had this um, kind of closet or like a shrank with all the documents in it and he knew how to work his way through it. So, um, of course, nowadays it's also very important to make those um, collections accessible to a larger audience. And, um, of course, it's not just possible to go into that room, to the closet and just take things out. So, to a certain extent, like... Um, are you thinking about ways on how to make those, um, like his collection accessible and what would be necessary to actually make that possible? And mm -hmm. also, yeah, like, do you have any reservations that are connected with yeah. that um, as a son, but also as a historian? Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, like what is your approach to making it mm -hmm. um, so I should say I'm only 25% of the, um, I, I own essentially 25% of the archive. I'm one of several inheritors. Uh, I'm the one who's interested um, through my academic connections um, uh, in the archive. Um, and, and I understand the Holocaust. And I, I uh, um, so, but the reality is, of course, all the other inheritors would have to agree on where it goes. And that's, that's a complicated story like it is in every family. But... Uh, in his will, he did ask that it goes to a uh, an academic institution eventually. So, so that is is the long range uh, plan. Uh, the reality is uh, that it, it's not it's not a traditional archive, even though I've sorted it and and and, and, and largely also to to retrieve um, personal items for such a transfer. Eventually, uh, I think it's important um, to recognize Johnny Moser uh, as um, this individual institution that he was in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, and all the way up. You know, uh, he is um, recognized in Austria really well. People who read German know about him. There's no doubt about it. But Holocaust studies is transported in English, right? That's why I'm speaking English right now in Vienna. And and that's just fine, but the reality is a so, um, so there needs to be uh, uh, more of a, uh, in my opinion, uh, more recognition of his work. So, so if it if ever went to an institution, of course, they'd need to understand these aren't just deportation lists that can, that, but that who actually collected them, what is the, what is the history, the post-war history of, of, of how this was transmitted to today. Um, and, and so that's, that's my mission always, to educate people about Johnny Moser in terms of early uh, Holocaust research. Uh, and again, it, it, as I said earlier, it, it, and it may be too strong to say it was a hostile environment because of course you could publish, you could do what you wanted, but the public wasn't interested in Austria. The public was hostile. But if, if you came to Vienna and you wanted to, from abroad, and you wanted to learn more about the Holocaust, sooner or later you'd end up at the Dove. Sooner or later they'd give you his phone number, and you'd call him, and you'd meet him, and that's how that worked. Uh, so there wasn't, they would never, you know, it'd be inconceivable in the 1970s to be a Holocaust archive or something like that. That just they couldn't have that name. And even the Dove, which has Widerstand in its name, resistance, as opposed to Holocaust, is... is uh, um, Kind of a misnomer there, yeah, but um, going back to your question, yeah, I think I mean the ultimate goal is that that this archive be does become available um, the way other archives are to the highest standards nowadays, and that that people can uh, access uh, more about the Holocaust in in, in Vienna. Uh, his NISCO book, of course, uh, already tells you a lot about what is in this archive and, and that is different from others. Um, there's a fair amount of information on deportations um, um, and, and also very bizarre notes uh, that, that strike me almost as random uh, when Eingaben uh, to the Gestapo in Vienna from the Jewish hospital asking about, you know, repairs and, and 
all kinds of um, things that, that you know might be interesting to a researcher at one point. But um, so that's that's essentially the information he collected. Um, he knew a lot of survivors, obviously in Vienna. Uh, all the NISCO uh, um, documents came from a survivor from NISCO who wanted somebody to take this over when there was nobody who was interested except for my father. So, uh, and, and you have to imagine he started collecting this in a one-bedroom Gemeindebau apartment eventually. He upgraded to its two-bedroom, three-bedroom. Ultimately, he was in a four-bedroom Gemeindebau apartment, always in the first district, but still small. Uh, so this, is not a lot, this wasn't a whole lot of space to, to collect things in. Um, and, uh, and so much has changed, particularly in Austria, in terms of, of, of Holocaust studies. You just have to remember that before 1986, um, people really either didn't know or didn't want to know. Uh, when I was 11 years old, I thought all my teachers were lying in the Stubenbastei because they, these people were born after the war. They were around 40 or they, you know, 50. And they, they, they literally said, we, we don't know what happened. We, didn't, we don't know what happened with the Jews. I mean, we just have vague notions. And I thought they were lying. Because if I knew, I mean, I could answer half of their questions. You know how smart you feel when your gymnasium teacher doesn't know anything that you do? Uh, so I thought they were liars. Nowadays, I know they weren't. No, they honestly just didn't know because the country had suppressed um, its history so successfully. Thank you very much. Maybe just like a quick follow up also, because you said like many survivors actually gave parts of his of their collections to your father also, and he researched a lot about like through them. Um, but like how much of those collections still need to be researched, or like how to what extent like your father managed to actually really um, yeah analyze research what he had, or is there a large part that is still untouched and actually. Yeah, and Pat um, for future research. Yeah, that will be interesting to see one day. Uh, you, you know, his archive is its primary documents that he collected. Then, of course, there's a lot of photocopies of research from archives that he received. Um, so, uh, and as I said, the NISCO uh, um, project he managed just before he died. I mean, he like he was 84 years old, and he got a laptop, and he just did nothing but he wrote. And then just at the, towards the end of the manuscript, then he broke his hip, and then that was it. But uh, it was almost as if he knew time was running out. I and mean, he was you know, working on a laptop. He figured out Gmail. He hated it all, by the way. He hated that technology. But he learned at an advanced age, and he, and he wrote it. Um, there are definitely more stories to be told from those documents. Um, they're not complete stories, right? You know, it's just it's 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 a fragmentary archive, like like most archives would be. Um, but it will be interesting to see one day, uh, hopefully sooner than later, uh, what historians can make of it, and in terms also of, of recognizing uh, where these where these documents were. Um, what I should point out is one thing that I that I noticed, uh, you know, by the 1980s when the Holocaust Museum. Um, was was being founded in Washington D.C. He got a letter that I think he felt was fairly insulting. It was a uh, like, dear Dr. Moser, we know you have documents. Would you like to just send them over? I mean, we'll pay for shipping, you know. Uh, and I think they wrote that to hundreds of people. But so then that made him a little paranoid. I think it's like, okay, yeah, now 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 it's an interesting topic. Now people with resources want to take over and push me aside. Um, so, so his archive is, of course, a mystery to many people still, I think, because of that, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so um, thank you for, um, for talking about um, Johnny Moser and his archives. And um, to take up what you said, I mean, we heard that in many talks that there are always new stories to be told. And that's why we are here. And um, we, we are still open for questions, um, so, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, insight.
And I have one comment and one question. Uh, comment uh, is about make, uh, making av available uh, your archive. I know that ERI, European Holocaust Research Infrastructure, uh, has a new project starting from next year, I think, the following year, uh, about a uh, uh, collection of private or small archives, and I know that they do good inventory in English. I know that Anastasia worked with them for producing inventory for Moldova, so maybe it can be opportunity for you and also <laughs> for researchers to use this archive uh, if you cooperate with the area. And uh, a question, actually, returning to the topic of silence, um, when I uh, took interview from Riva Molochkovetska, which I uh, had this case in my presentation, whose grandmother was killed uh, during Akson, and uh, her mother, uh, obviously she and her, her two younger sisters escaped uh, from Vinnitsa to Zmerin Kageto and survived, she mentioned that she didn't tell anybody before uh, me such details about, about experience of, your, of her family. And uh, I asked why, and she said that actually there was a war and everybody had common experience. Every family suffered, uh, and some families, uh, somebody was killed on front, somebody died in ghetto. So we, uh, she said that she thought that it's nothing actually to tell about, like it's not extraordinary. And then uh, I heard many times the same from Roma survivors that inside of family they uh, talked uh, and shared experience, but never outside, just because they didn't think some, something that they experience is valuable or they experienced something different. So this is my question to you. If I try to understand if this is the pattern in Ukraine and Soviet territory, or it's like common pattern for survivors. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I can't I can't really speak to how other survivors cope with it, except just anecdotally. It, it does seem that the other people say, yeah, it, you know, other people have the same thing. Uh, so what my father did see as being unique was him meeting Wallenberg and doing errands for Wallenberg. And um, those included um, getting a car. Like this is this penniless Austrian refugee who didn't get paid even, but he had that the Swedish embassy gave him a car so he could drive up to the foreign ministry on the, on the castle in Buda and deliver notes to the Aero Cross. So what Wallenberg did on some level, I'm sometimes thinking, my guy, but he knew Johnny Moser could do it. So this teenager would go in, he would um, then raise his hand, his right hand, entering, like saluting them with the Nazi greeting. And they're like, you know, okay. And, and of course he was a German speaker, so who are you to, and then he'd go in. Um, that worked several times. One time they didn't buy it because they're like, they looked at the swastikas on the Schutzpost and they're like, but it's a Schutzpost. And Wallenberg just happened to be there and grabbed him and took him. So again, um, but it also included there were wealthy Budapest Jews who wanted favors from Wallenberg. So they introduced Wallenberg to the back room of a restaurant where you could get whatever you wanted, there was no rationing. Wallenberg didn't need it, so he sent my father there. So my father got to, you know, he felt very privileged in that regard. Um, but so then after the war, it is clear, Wallenberg disappears, and, and that's kind of interesting, and then he, he, he had this close contact. Um, and uh, every time I, I think about Budapest, there were so many, so many, so many people there who wanted to be helped by Wallenberg, and many people got the Schutzpass. But Wallenberg did not actually know more than a few hundred uh, of the people he was helping. And so, so to be in that kind of contact and to be trusted, yeah, that was unique. And people knew about that very early on. So one of the things that would happen is every so often people would come to the apartment, not to talk about the Holocaust in Austria, but they wanted to know about Wallenberg. And, uh, and that was fine. And, and if they wanted to know what did you do, he loved talking about this, uh, including going to Hedge Sholom. It was a death march. And so Wallenberg saved um, 
people in Hedge Shalom, and my father went out with blank Schutz Pässe and gave them out and said, just say you have one, come and jump on the truck. And if you've seen Richard Chamberlain's um, 1985 portrayal of, of, of Wallenberg, and I, uh, it's, I call it, I think, Wallenberg, a hero story, or something like that. It's a, an American TV production. So that, that scene is actually there, and my father saw that. And he was then interviewed by Her Zoo magazine at the bad point. But, um, so he, he did like talking about that, but there were a lot of strange inquiries that people would come to him with, and, and, and this happened quite a bit in the early 80s, because Wallenberg was still missing, and they would come to the apartment, or, or they'd call up, and it would really irritate him because they would ask him, so you know him so well, so what are the odds of him surviving a gulag now after 36 years or so on? Which, of course, a ridiculous question to ask in terms of how, how, should, how should he have judged. But so, but as a child, that always left the impression on me, yeah, people did recognize that this very, very famous person who saved so many people, um, that, that, that Johnny Moser was somebody who would be able to comment on, 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 on how Wallenberg was in 1944. But um, uh, so, so, so he, was, he was known as, as kind of an eyewitness for Wallenberg. That was, that was a big thing then. Well, thank you very much for it's fascinating, and I'm from Budapest, Miltiko uh, Borna, so that's even more touching. And I just wanted to ask, uh, do you ever thought of, of publishing these notebooks or, or um, yeah, yeah? I mean, that's, that's, that's one of my ultimate goals, is to, to write about his, um, his work after the war, that is, of course, uh, his biography um, is incredibly detailed in German. Um, it also really, really well researched in regards to what's going on with domestic policies in Hungary, uh, which uh, is interesting to people interested in the Holocaust in Hungary. But then the last sentence of his biography is, well, we were back in Austria. We could start life afresh, right? Done. Uh, and And... Perhaps from his perspective in 2006, what was that to tell, you know, from, from his vantage point? But the reality is, um, particularly scholars who don't read German and English is the lingua franca and it is the language of Holocaust studies. Yes, so in the long run I'm planning to, but it's not really tied to the documents in the archive because what you really have here is it's, it's a comp, you have a survivor who has an interesting story with Wallenberg, uh, there are almost no documents from Hungary, even though he read Hungarian, was fluent in Hungarian, and that's why Wallenberg used him. He had these language skills. Um, he would listen to the radio. He could write bulletins. He would translate the Hungarian broadcasts. He could listen to the German broadcast. Language was a big problem in Budapest uh, for everybody. Uh, and um, But all that he had in his uh, collection was, of course, he had collected books on Wallenberg in Hungarian, but had been published in the 1990s. Um, so that's, that's one topic. And then you have, of course, the person who decides to stay in Austria. He had a visa to go to the United States in 1950. There's actually an angry letter from an organization that helped people Im immigrate to the United States. And they kept pestering him. We, have, we finally have all the documents. We've gone through all this process. Why aren't you leaving? You know? And, and he decided, after the failed coup attempt, there was a, coup, a communist coup attempt in Austria in 1950. After that failed, it was clear Austria wasn't going to become a people's republic. It wasn't going to become communist. And he went out and he got his party membership in the SPÖ and, and, and had you know, this very long, low-level political career in the Social Democratic Party in Austria, it didn't go to the United States. And I can explain that because he was kind of culturally tied to the United States, and the experience in Budapest uh, was one of homelessness and trying to figure out this alien language. I don't think he wanted to do that in the United States. It was just, it was comfortable here, and at the same time, it wasn't comfortable, because all your peers, all, peop all, all men his age, God knows what they did. All highly suspect, 
And I was trained. I mean, when I, as a child, grew up in, I would go around Vienna, and I was like, I saw a man his age. Was like, no, was he in Babia? Literally, that's what I would ask. You know, well, who knows? Probably not, but you never know. Um, so, um, yeah, this is something I couldn't relate to, but that was his personal choice, and it worked for him. Yeah, Michael. Michal Frankl, uh, the Masaryk Institute, Czech Academy of Sciences. Before I ask the question, I just uh, wanted to say that uh, your talk evoked the memories of Johnny Moser in the kitchen of uh, the Dokumentations Archive, meeting him uh, quite a few times when we were working on the Theresienstädter Gedenkbuch. Uh, so it's very nice kind of memory. Um, but I, what I wanted to ask you is something else, um, and that is, when you think about the future of this archive, um, do you think um, uh, separately or differently about the possible digital future and the possible analog future? Is the digital perhaps a way to open the archive while the analog physical archive might have slightly different um, different future. Uh, I was just wondering how you think about it, or whether perhaps some smaller digital projects might be a way to step by step um, um, open the archive to the public. So, because the archive is now uh, in an apartment that, you know, it, it can't stay there ultimately. So, so it is going to, I hope, it will be digitized. I won't be doing it, you know, so it will be some some other. But yes, I mean, the, the broader, you know, and then this is again something that that, that all the, the, the family has to decide, and there's lots of different opinions. So I can, you know, my 25% don't, don't say everything. But the reality is, is yes. The more people get to, you know, see this, the better, and, and digital, yes, that would be the gold standard nowadays. Uh, and thank you for mentioning Theresienstadt, because that really was a topic. And um, in 1988, when Czechoslovakia was still communist, there was a symposium in Theresienstadt. And it was fascinating to me. He went there. It was just, you know, it was a conference. There were lots of other survivors and people who were interested in the Holocaust. And he came back from what was still communist Czechoslovakia, which he never visited otherwise, right, because he just didn't go there didn't talk about it, but he went there and he came back so energized and so happy. And it was like, oh my God, he went there to talk about, you know. But it was, it was people, it was kindred spirits who wanted to know more about Theresienstadt and what they were talking about was terrible. But I think these were all people who wanted to process like him. Some of them scholars, some of them. And I, I, I remember seeing the pictures. And of course he also, he came back with stories about how terrible the communist regime is and how ridiculous it is, you know. And uh, but, 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 and he had to do that. He was very, very staunchly anti-communist. Um, but, but yeah, Theresienstadt was very important to him. So I'm, I'm not, not surprised that he continued talking for his entire life about that. Yeah. So um, Natalia had a question, and then Julie, and then Jana. Yes. Also, oh, thank you so much, and I. I'm thinking of um, a son of uh, Nachman Blumenthal, uh, who is coping with a huge apartment full of uh, shelves and drawers. Um, uh, but uh, so I have a question. What's your impression of um, the hierarchy of documents in this discussion about ego documents, the voices of survivors versus official documents? So it's, it's uh, you know, the topics are a mishmash in his collection because you'll have NISCO and then you'll have deportations to other places, then you have things on Theresienstadt, then you have his own personal documents. Uh, um, with an archive of, of his small scale, I, I've never thought about, about hierarchies and, and, and that's, that's something for other people to think about one day. Um, it, and this is something to go back to what Marianne said. It was fascinating to work through it because I got to understand him better and I got to see what, what he was collecting. And when and I say collecting, of course, it was given to him, right? Or, 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 or he got something cheap. And because there were also books that, that weren't interesting because he didn't have the resources. Uh, and by the time I was a graduate student 20 years ago, I would frequently get a phone call and say, can you interlibrary loan in the US this article for me? And of course, immediately got it and mailed it to him. Uh, so, but then I got to see the limits 
that's when I really saw the limits of what he was doing in Vienna, because I, as a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, within a few days could get him anything and photocopy it, and he could not here, and, and the Döf couldn't either. And he didn't have the affiliation with the university, and the University of Vienna wouldn't have been quite as fast either as, as, as the University of Pennsylvania would have been so... Um, so the, the, you do see the limits of it, and, and his archive is as much about the Holocaust as it is about post-war Austria. Um, and you just have to realize how delayed we are here in this country about processing. Even the monument that was just opened a week ago took forever. And, and that was, an, I remember he was, of course, uh, at the Döf, and they were processing all these names in 1998, I think, and then still took 22 years to actually create the monument. So, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. So um, I had initially two questions, one about the archive itself, but I think it's mostly been answered more or less. I just want to say it's really fascinating, and I look forward to hearing about how it's eventually digitized and made accessible. Um, my second question is very personal, and feel free to not answer it. It goes back to the um, your initial narrative about the accumulation of the archive. You gave a lot of personal anecdotes of the relationship between you and your father, and the telephone ringing, and these walks, and all these things. Um, what about your mother? Did she, um, how did she relate to all this? Um, if it was a relatively late or relationship, he was already deep into this world. Um, did she help him? Uh, it just, yeah. Was she also a survivor? All these yeah, questions. thank you for that question. So it, it uh, she was a historian too, um, and they met uh, through the Döv. Um, uh, she's a, an American, and um, but she after 20 years, left him and went back to the United States and then didn't want anything to do with the topic of the Holocaust ever again. And years later, very soon, started mixing things up. And I could never tell willfully or not. Um, so um, the, the one thing that, that I inherited from my father is, uh, and, and on the occasions when I teach Holocaust studies courses at my university, I'm able to teach it very sachly without breaking out. I mean, there's, there's things you can make me break out in tears, but not what I teach to the students because it's just that, um, uh, it was that much of a, you know. Um, but it's very difficult for most people. Uh, his sister, for instance, um, also told a lot of anecdotes, but you could never ask his sister what happened in Budapest. She's like, no, I'm not talking about that now. Whereas him, you could ask at any time, you could ask him, um, and he would very objectively tell you about it. So then as a teenager, I jumped to the ridiculous conclusion that, oh, perhaps that's the masculine versus the feminine reaction, which is absolutely not. Uh, I think my aunt was much closer to the more common way of, of it comes out when it comes out. Um, what I do have to say, both of them did, and it was like living in a Holocaust class for 18 years. We would go through Austria, and they would tell you, oh, this Nazi owned this house, or this happened there, or if a classic movie was on, uh, all, the, all the Austrian actors, what kind of großer, kleiner, mittlerer Nazi, how, what size of Nazi were they, uh, um, and what did they do? They had all this trivia... Uh, um, with my aunt, a trip to Graz was always a disaster. My aunt loved going on day trips, but Graz, um, after two trips to Graz, I never asked her to go to Graz again because by the time we arrived in Graz, she was grumpy and she like argued with everybody. It was just too many Nazis there in her mind. I don't know why. It was, you know, but she just had, and she couldn't process it. Um, both of them had no go zones. Burgenland, both an interest an area they liked to go to. Pandorf was difficult, very, very painful memories. That's where they were driven out, their hometown. So they weren't Viennese Jews before the Holocaust. So when they came to Vienna in their lower 20s, it was easier to deal with that. But the topic was always, was always there. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm rambling now. But uh, So that's, that's, that's essentially... Uh, uh, um, but yeah, his collection, uh, he was just obsessed with, with understanding all these things. 
uh, and, 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 and explaining uh, to what extent uh, famous Austrians were involved with the regime. And he actually apparently had, look, had looked into this and had, for I'm sure, many conversations. And I don't think he was unique. I'm sure many other people who dealt with, the, with, with that knew about famous Austrians and their involvement. Janis Tarek, Wiener Wiesenthal Institut für Holocaust-Studien. Ich werde das jetzt einmal auf Deutsch fragen, weil Sie sehr gut als Absolvent von Stummbastei Deutsch sprechen. Äh, wissen Sie oder beinhaltet das Archiv Ihres Vaters Hinweise darauf, wie Johnny Moser äh, die Persönlichkeit von Simon Wiesenthal beurteilte und seine Arbeit? Also, ich habe, wie, wie ich angefangen habe, ich das das, das in meiner Recherche im, im Archiv, also ich habe da, danach gesucht und ich habe nichts gefunden. Es, es gibt nichts, was ich gesehen habe. Ich weiß, was er von Wiesenthal gehalten hat, aber, und, und, aber äh, es, gibt, es gab natürlich, man hat sich gegenseitig nicht verstanden. Ja, da waren politische Unterschiede. Uh, mein Vater hat grundsätzlich mit Menschen, die ÖVP nah nichts zu tun gehabt. Er hat auch einen Julius Meindl nicht betreten können in den 80er Jahren, weil das uh, nur, nur beim Konsum eingekauft. Also, und uh, es gibt schon im Archiv zwischen Willi Krell, Wilhelm Krell und, und Wiesenthal gibt es schon Informationen. Nicht, aber das ist nicht direkt zwischen meinem Vater und Wiesenthal. Aber da, und mein Vater war sehr nah zu seinem Schwager, Willi Krell. Und ähm, ja, also da, da, dazu war einiges. Und, und, und was, ich vom, was ich im Archiv gelernt habe, ist, dass äh, äh, also die Wiesenthals waren ja in Linz zuerst, und dann, weil sie Angst hatten vor der, der sowjetischen Zone. Und dann hat also Krell geholfen, dass sie nach Wien kommen. Und dann ist, haben da sind sehr schnell so, also Konflikte entstanden, die ich aber jetzt, ehrlich gesagt, das letzte Mal, wie ich die, diese, diese Dokumente angeschaut habe, habe das nicht sehr interessant gefunden, weil ich das irgendwie banal fand, was, was da für Auseinandersetzungen waren. Aber ja, das ist im Archiv. Wir wissen, es ist natürlich interessant, eines Tages, wenn das ein, ein größeres Publikum sehen kann. Aber zwischen meinem Vater und Wiesenthal gibt es, soweit ich weiß, keine schriftlichen Dokumente, obwohl ich die gerne gefunden hätte. Weil äh, ich ja, na, das auch gerne herzeigen würde. Aber äh, äh, wir haben auch sehr nah, also Wiesenthal war ja am, 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 am also drei Straßen entfernt. Meine Mutter hat für Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles gearbeitet, während der Waldheim-Affäre. Und Wiesenthal durfte nicht wissen, dass sie für ihn, dass sie dort, und, und, aber Wiesenthal war ja dann in Bezug zu Waldheim, hat nicht gegen Waldheim reagiert, wie das mein Vater erwartet hätte. Aber also sonst war da eher eine, ist einfach nur eine Distanz gewesen, eine Distanz. Dankeschön. Ja. Ah, hola. Yeah. Um, Alexandra Stefan. Uh, I was really impressed by the drawings and maps that you showed from the notebook. And I was wondering if this was some kind of like a way of like remembering for your father. Was it like important medium? And also you showed at the same time the pictures of the buildings which were like drawn. And I was wondering if maybe you took these pictures, like uh, mm -hmm. if uh, like... Um, Your father um, somehow like teach, taught you space um, anyhow. Like, did you go together? You mentioned already that he was showing some Nazi buildings, but was it uh, important uh, experience for you, like, to learn uh, by space uh, yeah. from your father about the past? Yeah. And one more question: uh, Did your father ever go to Nisko, for instance? Did he go to places he researched? So uh, Nisko, no, uh, he he never went to Nisko. Um, so spaces in Budapest were a, a big deal. Um, I went to Budapest with my father on three occasions that I remember, 1980 when I was five years old, then 1988 when I was 13 years old, and 1996 when I was 21. And 1980 was brutal because he was 55 years old, so he was pretty healthy, and I was five years old, and he ran through the city, like from one end to the other, and then because he had to like extemporaneously find things. And 
Uh, his sister was there and my mother, and they were all exasperated because he just had to see these, you know, and he didn't even take pictures, but he just went, well, what does it look like now? And then we're going to go here and there, you know. Uh, never lingering anywhere. In 1988, things had slowed down. He had had a bypass surgery, so um, this was good. So we walked slower, okay? Uh, <laughs> and in 1996, even slower, it involved cafes and restaurants, but he still couldn't make any sense of it because it's like this, because he was, you know, it's not until his biography was published that I could put these things together. And then I realized that I had to, you know, one day take over this narrative. So, or at least I felt I should take it over. So I've started going to Budapest every year since 2007. And in 2017, I actually retraced, I actually ran through Budapest at his speed, his 1980 speed, um, which was quite exhausting. Um, but went to all those places and took, took pictures uh, I actually take students to Budapest every summer, and they don't even know about Weinberg, but I just, and I go to all these places and the famous places, and I started learning Hungarian this summer. I'm now at the B1 level, so, so yes, so, and this has very little to do with the archive. That's more the, the kind of the, how, how do you, as a second generation survivor, keep telling the stories that he lived through? Um, but space in Budapest is, is incredibly uh, important. Um, and when you go to Budapest today, like the Jewish neighborhoods, um, like the Rumbach Utsa is so cleaned up today. I mean, it's not as clean as Vienna, but it, it, you don't recognize the situation that actually was going on back then, which is people living, multiple people in one room without bathrooms and fleas. And uh, one of the stories he always told about Budapest, he had a blanket and he moved it and he'd moved the blanket and then two seconds later, the fleas would follow the blanket. Um, but uh, his notebook, by the way, has Hungarian poetry in it, which was fascinating and, and, and a proof to me, because he always said his Hungarian was terrible, but he obviously listened to radio broadcasts. And, and so that's part of why I learned Hungarian, but also to understand how Hungarians see this time period. Um, and it has funny stories too, and I will uh, perhaps tell you this as a, he wrote about Schiller and what kind of what kind of plays Schiller dedicated plays to various nationalities, right? And I'm not going to go for all the you know there's Wallenberg for this no uh, Wallenstein and then this and which one did he give for the Germans? There's one play Schiller dedicated for the Germans, the Räuber, the robbers. And it's more funny if you read it. I mean, I should have brought it in today, but uh, I, I've mentioned it before. But so there's also funny coping mechanisms. Uh, and then there's some real teenage writings, like he writes about which people he likes in Budapest and who he doesn't like, and, uh, and, and who's helpful and who's not helpful. And, uh, uh, and then there's this, like, the Budapest, the Judenverfolgung that I shared with you. I mean, that's almost like, like pre-academic writing, you know? But it's, I think it's just a coping mechanism. And this was written very often in places where he was one of several people in the room. Um, in that one building, when the Soviet liberation came, there were several hundred Jews, several families in these basements waiting for the Soviets. Um, and, and of course, all the shelling going on outside, grenades being thrown in. Uh, and there's one thing he writes in one part of the notebook. He writes, Wieder einen Tag überlebt. Again, we survived the day. You really just live day by day, right? So I don't, you know, I don't think he expected this notebook to survive or him to survive. So that's why it has to have been a coping mechanism. Of course, teenagers write diaries all the time. So, yeah, in that regard, it's nothing too special. Yeah, so thank you once again for this round table, for this introduction to Johnny Moser, for those of you who didn't know him, and um, also for all of us who know him as a scholar. Um, and um, yeah, what, what you said about like now that you described once again this notebook, um, it's it's really fascinating because I, I would re, re, as a literary scholar I would want to read this anecdote on Schiller and um, so it has 
it ha has some German studies <laughs> approach and Holocaust studies. So we would find a lot in this. And um, for now, we are uh, finished uh, with this um, day. So thank you here and thank you in the virtual space. And um, I just wanted to say, since you mentioned it, um, this new monument in Vienna, if you're here in Vienna and you want to see it, it's the Namensmauern. It's close to the Viennese University, in, actually in front of the Austrian uh, Nationalbank. And it contains the names of the Austrian Jewish Holocaust victims. And um, it's controversial. You, you have read about it maybe. But um, when you stand before it, it's really impressive to see. And um, I invite you, if you have time, also to walk there and have a look. And um, yeah, so thank you. And we see each other tomorrow. And yeah, yeah. Okay. whenever. <laughs> Goodbye. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah.